Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for week 17 of our Survive and Thrive webinars that we've been running with Gatwick Diamond Business. Um, my name's Daisy and I'm the Community Manager at Sussex Innovation Centre in Falmouth. Um, obviously, I haven't been organising any face-to-face -face events um, for our members um, in a while, uh, so I've been involved in running these weekly webinars. Um, a couple of housekeeping bits. Um, just at the start, obviously, um, we can't see you or hear you, I'm afraid, but please do feel free um, to pop stuff in the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, just make sure that you change your settings uh, to all panellists and attendees um, so that everyone can see. Um, if you've got any questions for the panel, um, please pop those in the Q&A. Um, and just so you know, the session is being recorded and we're sharing uh, all the webinar recordings on our website. Um, I think that's about it for the housekeeping. Um, anyone who joined us for the webinar last week will have heard me referring to our Year of the Woman, uh, which we ran in 2018. And that's when our female founders events really um, first started. Uh, so we wanted to use this week as an opportunity to speak to the, some of the female founders who have uh, have joined our network during this time. Um, so with me here today is Anya from Eshcon, um, who actually spoke at our last in-person, face-to-face female founders event in February, which seems like such a long time ago. <laughs> it really does. Um, also, uh, we have Daniela, who's from the uh, Regional Studies Association, um, uh, who are members of the Innovation Centre and based here in Falmouth. Uh, and On, who is one of the newest to our network and joined us last month uh, for our virtual meetup um, and is right at the start of her entrepreneurial journey. So I'm going to hand over to her now. She's going to tell you about her new business. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for inviting me to join on this uh, panel as well. I'm, I'm really honoured. Um, so yes, my name is On Brophy and I'm an entrepreneur of a circular economy startup. Um, so right now we're trying to bring awareness around the topic of the takeaway, throwaway culture. So I'd like to put a disclaimer um, because my slides involves quite a lot of food. Um, so I hope that you've eaten. <laughs> um, I'll just share my slides now. So our vision is to thrive as a circular economy product service. Um, also known as a donut economy, um, as our business model is based around a closed loop um, with an objective to eliminate single-use food packaging and we're starting in Brighton. We've chosen Brighton because we believe that we can flourish due to its strong built-in environmental policies and locals aspiring for change. Um, it also happens to be our nearest urban city where we once settled, so we're quite familiar with the culture around here. Um, our social enterprise produces, distributes and cleans reusable metal food containers. So where food containers can hire our containers on a subscription and this infrastructure allows food vendors to offer reusable containers to their customers instead of solely using um, single use disposables. So maybe think of um, the glass milk bottle service that we, we once had. Um, we hope to collaborate with food vendors, corporations and at events um, to help restaurants achieve their sustainable goals. So this movement will help build a food loving community without but without the waste. We see ourselves as a facilitator, giving people the choice to consume consciously and build awareness around food waste packaging. We want to make it convenient and affordable so people can choose to reuse. Um, this can be achieved by using a deposit return scheme, so where customers receive their deposit for returning the container. Um, you're probably aware with the three R's, the reduce, reuse, recycle. So the reuse model is the best practice in this situation as our takeaway industry is set to increase. So our containers will be used and depreciated many times before we resort to recycling it to fulfill that closed loop. We aim to be transparent and traceable, and we will be able to achieve our service at scale by collaborating with the majority of restaurants, 
takeaways, offices, um, and the universities near us. Um, basically, anywhere where food is served as takeaway. We want to design out waste and pollution as much as possible by keeping our products in use. Um, regenerative and restorative by design. This means looking at the whole picture so that we take the minimum amount of resources out and put back what we've taken. We can start by choosing to keep our supply chain local to reduce our impact on CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases. We strive to become a B Corp and support the circular economy. Um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with B Corp, um, this is a certification of social and environmental performance. Um, we hope to contribute to organisations such as 1% for the Planet. So a, a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up to Vietnamese parents who have the mentality of using what you already have. Um, this is because they were immigrants when they came to this country about 40 years ago and they only brought the clothes on their backs. So our house was full of makeshift upcycled items and I found the whole repurposing aspect really fascinating. Um, and then eventually this became a creative passion of mine. Um, this steered me into a career path in product design, um, which opened my eyes to the whole life cycle of products. Um, going on maternity leave uh, gave me the time to reflect um, so I wanted to contribute to something really meaningful, which will help resolve a world problem. Um, this was still broad, so I took a course in biomimicry and another course in circular economy. These courses helped me to refine what I really felt passionate about. Um, I landed on food packaging as one of the most toxic systems in our society because of its single use mentality. I've since dedicated my time on taking on the challenge to reduce food waste packaging. Our products consist of a locally manufactured metal container. Our service allows food vendors to hire our containers on a subscription. So customers can opt in to use our containers by paying a deposit which will be refundable upon returning the container to any participating store or drop-off bin. Then we will collect the dirty containers back to sanitize and ready to redistribute. It will be catered for on the go and to the home delivery. In terms of the incentives around this whole supply chain, um, restaurants can show their support for the elimination of single use um, and build customer loyalty at the same time. Customers can choose to gain incentives and know that they're not leaking harmful toxins from plastics into their own food and the sea. And then finally, uh, local authorities will save costs on litter pollution. So our service will enable a rapid move away from disposable plastics. We're using our business to tackle environmental issues at the core of our foundation. A little bit of stats um, based on UK figures. Um, so 10 million of us now use food delivery apps. Um, home delivery takeaway plus takeout on the go accounts to 3 million takeaways every single day. So we throw away 11 billion pieces of disposable food packaging every year. New research reveals that the food to go sector is set to grow by 26.4% um, by 2024. So these extremely high figures can be turned into an opportunity, turning waste into a reusable model that can generate revenue um, at a growing rate. Told you about um, lots of food here. Um, the most popular single use containers um, include polypropylene, foil, card, polystyrene, and plant based materials. Um, there is a growing concern over the health impacts caused by the leakage of harmful chemicals from plastics into food. More recently, research has highlighted that suggested eco alternative plant fiber packaging has shown to be um, to have more profound problems. Virtually all fibre bowls have been treated with the PFAS, which is a fluorinated forever chemical that doesn't break down in the environment and is more likely to contaminate compost than to increase soil health. It interferes the, um, with our hormonal and reproductive system, such as the development of the fetus, and it impacts the immune system. It's been linked to reduce responses to vaccines in children. 
um, and it promotes the development of certain cancers as well. Within the EU, the end of life treatment for poly, um, polystyrene takeaway containers account to 50% incineration and 50% landfilled. And then with polypropylene, the, the highest um, amount of material used within the takeaway sector, only 11% is recycled and then the, less, the rest is landfilled and incinerated, incinerated. So in short, very few of these single use plastics are recycled even though you can recycle them. Using a more natural resource like bamboo doesn't tackle the problem as it would maintain a linear system and would only shift the pressure on the type of resource. Um, compostable packaging is popular among food vendors as there is a great interest in using sustainable alternatives. PLA, for example, is a bioplastic which people are also actively trying to use and recycle but we are sometimes recycling PLA with other recyclable plastics, which can result in contamination as well as littering. So technically, um, PLA can be compostable, but, it's, but it often doesn't break down as well as advertised, which means that many composting facilities reject them um, and they end up being landfilled. Vendors have taken responsibility by stocking such items. Customers love the idea, but in practice, compostables are rarely composted by the customer or waste stream, as we simply lack the infrastructure to collect and process them. Compostables tend to thrive at places where there is a dedicated disposal and collection service, but it must be accompanied by robust communication. Um, composting is one solution, but it's not the best. Um, Reuse is better in practice as it reduces health impacts from virgin materials and emis emissions from incineration. Um, based on our research, stainless steel metal has proven to be the best for reuse. Metal can be sourced locally. Um, our product can be reused, recycled without losing its material performance. Metal is highly durable, which allows the product to be in use for a long time. It's dishwasher safe, can survive the toughest food stains, um, can be insulated um, to sustain hot and cold foods. Um, however, it's not microwavable compared to plastics, but metals don't admit toxins into our food. Um, metals can be heated up on the stove or oven, for example, um, but we know that offices usually only have a microwave. So um, you can perhaps transfer your food onto a plate or if you've just bought your lunch, you're probably likely to eat it during your, your lunch break. In terms of how our product will, service will work, um, as it's quite a complex issue, um, there will be quite a lot, a lot of uh, complex um, systems within the supply chain. So I tried to kind of make it as simple as possible by writing around a donut. Um, so what we do is we clean, dry and sort um, for distribution. Um, we deliver the containers to the vendors, the riders collect um, and the used containers, and then the vendors offer the containers to the customer. The cu customer uses it with the food purchase, returns it, collects, and then we collect it, um, and then it just goes around in a, a loop as well. Um, so I've got pictures on the side to show um, other companies that have done very similar um, product services for their takeaway culture in their community. Um, so if you want to follow my progress, you can follow me on LinkedIn or Instagram um, where I'll share my makeshift projects. Um, but I think I'll stop it there because the longer I keep my mouth open, the less I'll learn from others. So um, I want to hear from you guys. If you wouldn't mind um, participating in this interactive poll that we've um, tried to figure out the other day. Um, if, if Daisy would kindly post this up, um, it would be nice to hear your feedback on um, the service. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Hopefully um, everyone can see the poll attendees. Can you see the poll? Oh yeah, brilliant. People are polling already. Um, thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I think if, as long as uh, you're happy with this, I can share the slides with everyone um, following this event. Um, as a as a kind of such an early stage business, how have you found um, lockdown and kind of the effects of COVID? 
Has that um, impacted on you at all? Uh, not so much, but um, lockdown has actually been more effective in terms of um, managing my time. For example, say if um, I need to have a mi meeting with uh, my business advisor or financial advisor, um, rather than spending half a day going to, to meet up, um, we'll have the kind of more preferred video call, which saves time on, on traveling. And then also um, my partner is currently working from home as well. So in terms of um, arranging childcare, that's been more flexible. Um, so that, that's the kind of positive side. Um, also in terms of the whole kind of being in lockdown, um, I've been picking up the phone more to like friends and family. For example, I've got a friend who um, at the beginning of lockdown, uh, we decided to do like um, a book club, which um, turned into uh, like a, a weekly meeting for me <laughs> where I would share my progress. And so it became like, um, she was almost like a, a support mentor, mentor, which was actually really super, super useful um, to kind of like think out loud. Um, I guess on the downside, in terms of the R&D, um, the development of the container has been um, a bit more slow because it's largely based on kind of user experience and observations, but that's been quite difficult to do because the, the vendors have been closed um, for business. And that's kind of, things are starting to open up again now. So kind of, is that the next steps for you? Is this kind of what can we expect for you? Yeah. Yeah. So since um, so since markets have been able to open, I've been um, going to them and um, like they've been super helpful. At the moment, um, the market vendors have been really supportive in terms of the whole reuse. They you know they they would like to tick the, those sustainable goals, and so um, it was really nice to kind of fit, hear the feedback and then also obviously the logistics behind it all. Um, so I'm quite optimistic about the outlook of uh, post COVID. Um, and hopefully the, this kind of whole pause um, between us all has kind of given us a chance to reflect more on our kind of responsibilities towards the, the environment. Um, but I guess my aim now is to um, carry out focus groups with vendors and customers, um, which will determine how their container uh, will look. So I suppose, I guess, like if, if anyone's interested in like participating or collaborating um, with me in terms of kind of anything around the supply chain, that'd be cool. Because I'm, I'm also looking to um, collaborate with professionals in each um, districts of the supply chain to kind of build this community. And then and then finally look for, for funding to, to make it all happen. Thank you. And um, we've actually just got a question um, just come in for you. Um, from Georgina, um, who's loved hearing about the business. Um, she wonders um, how you see the deposit uh, container scheme transferring to less affluent areas. Um, she understands that uh, the customer will get deposit back, um, but does the business or the customer pick up any additional costs? Um, well, we're hoping to make um, this whole service free for the customer. Um, so, and then it would be more about the food vendor um, who pays for the subscription. So it would be like a monthly subscription um, where they would provide these containers. And then I'll, I'll just kind of put, you know, a price on it. Say if like you pay four pounds for this container as a customer with your food purchase, then once you return the container, you will receive the money back. And I'm hoping to make it fully refundable. Um, so that it's more about the food vendors that would pay for the service plus um, I'm looking for like local authorities to hopefully contribute as well because that's where they inject their money to pay for this whole service anyways but on the kind of more littering pollution side of things. Uh, and one more question as well um, from Maria. Hi Maria, um, how do you produce the items without adding impact to the planet? So in terms of um, the materials um, I'm looking for a manufacturer where um, we're looking to purchase um, recycled stainless steel so where the impact had already been done say like with um, our kettles and toasters um, they're all kind of made from stainless steel which would be put into to landfill or at a metal scrap recycling and so I, um, I'm looking to contact these resources and use those materials that are already um, 
you know, on, um, around locally and then kind of turn that into our container. I mean, things like um, the whole chain as well, like looking at um, how much water waste we, we use um, to clean the metal containers. We're kind of looking at how to reduce our impact throughout the whole supply chain. Yeah, I'm just going to end the poll here. Thanks for everyone who took part. Thank you. Uh, and share the results. Hopefully everyone can see that. Great. And then I'm going to pass over. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass over to Anya now. Hello there. Right. Let's see if I can share my screen. Great. Hopefully you can see that. So my name is Anya Ledwith from Environmental Management Consultancy, ESHCOM. Um, so it's quite interesting that uh, we've got uh, two environmental type um, organisations speaking to you today. Um, when people think about the environment, you often see really sort of negative images. I mean, it's like the, the, the beaches awash with, with plastic litter is the classic thing, you know, like um, uh, hedgehogs stuck in cans, you know, uh, melting ice caps and polar, polar bears sort of clinging for dear life. And this is all really, really important. Of course it is. But actually, I want to focus on the positive side of our wonderful world. So I've just got a few photos here. These are all photos that I've taken of, of you know, beaches and towns and uh, organisations that I've visited. But actually, just to be, make us aware that we do live in a beautiful, beautiful place. We are lucky to live in this world. And we've actually got to do something really important to, to protect it. And, and it's not just the likes of us environmentalists going on about it all the time. And this COVID-19 has raised the issues of environmental and social issues in people's uh, minds now. They're really happy to go out for a cycle ride with the, with the family in the local area. Um, the roads are emptier were during lockdown, the, the air was cleaner. So people are more aware of it and, and are committing to changing their consumer habits. So there's a, just one, one of many um, uh, research uh, polls that I've seen recently with Cap Gemini. They're saying 65% of consumers are more mindful about the impact of their purchases post lockdown. Now, you might just think that's a bit of a, um, a knee-jerk reaction, but that's not actually new because 80% of them had already changed their purchasing habits in the past 12 months for social or environmental issues. So there, there is a great big groundswell of individuals and companies requiring their suppliers to take environmental issues and social issues into account. And that's where I come in. So I'm an environmental management consultant, but I, my story starts when I was 10, 10 years old, sitting on the floor in front of the TV, watching the glorious, wonderful David Attenborough on life on earth. And I just saw what a beautiful place we live in. And I knew that is what I wanted to do with my career. And that picture there, oh, don't I look cute? I'm a little bit younger than, than 10 there, maybe, but I couldn't find one that didn't look awful. But, but you, can see, you can see the red hair came, has come through through the entire journey. But so I knew that I, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I, I went to university. I did, did a degree. I did a master's. I've always worked in organisations that want to have a positive impact on the planet. And about, I think it was about, 14 years ago, I set up ESHCOM, Environmental Management Consultancy, and I help startups, fast growth and corporates reduce their risk, cut costs, save time, but importantly, win business as well. I'm also chairman of Gatwick Diamond Business, the uh, local business networking organisation that this seminar is being run in conjunction with, with Sussex Innovation. So ESHCOM is an award-winning consultancy, and I specialise in a number of services, environmental management systems, EMS, uh, to the international standard ISO 14001. I also look at carbon reporting, carbon footprinting, energy efficiency and energy audit. So we've got SECA and ESOS. These are two pieces of legislation that apply to large organisations. So not only are the consumers pushing this, actually it's legislation as well that's pushing this. 
But what, I, what I want to get across to my clients is that there are commercial benefits from effective environmental management. So environmental management is all about sort of understanding, managing and improving your environmental impact. So that could be anything from energy consumption, waste production, the water you use, the, the materials and the, the, uh, the paper that you're using, the transport, but also an impact on, on, on the company from the environment, the impact of floods and heat waves that are going to become far more common from climate change. But at the, at the centre, it's always having some sort of formalised structure and some leadership from top management that is the best way to get, get change within the organisation. But I realise that it can be a bit scary to get started. People think, well, it's just me or I've only got a tiny little business. What difference can I make? And that, that, I love this quote from Becky Reese. If you think you're too small to make a difference, you've never been in bed with a mosquito. Not too bad, but you know, you're lying in bed and you can hear this thing buzzing around your bedroom and it just keeps you awake at night. Tiny little thing does make a difference. So I, I use this nudge theory to make small but continual improvements within my clients so they don't get scared. A lot of them just, just feel, oh my God, this is too much. I can't do it. Where do I start? But I guide you through the process and I'll make it relevant, interesting and rewarding. And I won't go through all the, all the details there, but just a couple, couple of bits and pieces of people that I've worked with. Hotel kitchens, tiny changes to behavioural and operational changes to save 15% on their gas. I've got Roband Electronics saving over £1,000 a year and three tonnes of carbon just on their lighting improvements. The University of Kent, uh, 3,000 tonnes of carbon every year. I haven't worked with these guys, Elvis and Crest, but you might have heard of them. They make beautiful handbags out of old fire hoses. So coming back to the whole circular economy um, approach. And they say that they can generate £100,000 of value from one tonne of waste product that they're taking out of, the, out of the waste stream and make into products, which I think is fabulous. So... Daisy asked me to talk about what the challenges and the opportunities of, of COVID-19 are. Um, I'll, I'll start with this, I was going to say fabulous photo of me. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Everyone's wearing face masks nowadays. Hopefully, please wear a face mask. Excellent. Well done, Daisy. Um, this face, this is my face mask, and it shows the climate stripes that have been, have been produced by Professor Ed Hawkins from the University of Reading. And this is really complex climate data showing average global temperatures across the world for the last 170 years, I think. So colder years are darker blue, hotter years are red. And you can see going left to right, so from, from the past to the more current years, that there is a definite increase in, in warming. Anyway, I, that's, that's by the by, that's, that's something quite interesting. But from my new ways of working, challenges for the organisation. So obviously the virtual meetings and the workshops and the committee meetings that I have to run have to be done virtually now, which is great as on said about reducing your um, transport and the time it takes, but actually it does have challenges. I, I run a, a committee for people that have never met each other. We're, we're um, all over the country and actually getting them to gel in a friendly environment so that we can really get the best out of people is, really, is quite challenging. I've put down there remote environmental auditing. I quite often go to my client's sites and look around their site, make sure they're complying with the law, looking, looking for opportunities for improvement. And obviously we can't do that during lockdown. So I've been developing the concept of remote environmental auditing with my institute, Institute of Environmental Management, and teaching other environmental professionals how to do that. But there is, as, as I said earlier, there's great demand for more information about environment. So this build back better concept. And for my business, there are new services being developed and particularly for SMEs, while I tend to have um, helped much more corporates and large companies before and de developing more sort of um, services for SMEs. And I've got to get far more interactive on social media. God, the thought of doing vlogs and pieces to camera like this is actually absolutely terrifying. But 
that's something I'm biting the bullet, but I'm doing a lot of writing as well. So I've just said I'm writing my book. For years I've been talking about this. It's all about environmental management systems. And I'm using the time that I would have spent traveling to all of these meetings and networking and everything to use that time to actually write. So if you have environmental stories, if your company or you know organizations that have ISO 14001 management system, I want to hear from you and learn from your experiences, good or bad, so I can put that in the book. But one last thing, it's not just about what the business is doing and how it, how I can improve there is the element of giving back as well you know we are more social we are more caring and kind now so it's important to keep in touch with other people networking face to face isn't happening at the moment but you can do it remotely that is working and through GDB we do an awful lot of that but also one-to-ones with people as well ha having that reach out and that friendly friendly face, a friendly shoulder to cry on remotely, maybe, or just give a little bit of encouragement and, and, and you, know, uh, you know, go, you go girl, you can do it. It, it really does help. Donating to charity, supporting charity, teaching, but also mentoring other, other people that are helping, um, that, that are starting maybe out on their business journey. I was just speaking to one lady yesterday who, who's just starting out, it's an exciting time. And, you know, if I can share my experiences, good and bad, over the last who, how, how many years it was, 14, 15 years, I think we could all benefit from that. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you for your time. And I'll pass back to, to uh, Daisy. Thank you, Anya. Another really, really interesting presentation there. Um, if we're kind of thinking kind of post-COVID, do you think some of those kind of new working practices that you've, you've talked about, do you think that's something that you'll kind of continue with? Definitely. Kind of, yeah. Definitely. I mean, the remote environmental auditing, it has worked during lockdown. It's not perfect, but it, ha it does uh, require us or allow us to look at certain environmental issues or certain clauses of the standard or certain pieces of legislation. So, you know, we can continue to do that. But the virtual networking and cutting down on the time sitting on the M25 or on, in the train. It's brilliant. Love it. Make use of the time and have better work-life balance. Yeah, I think um, everyone has enjoyed having <laughs> more time to themselves. All to clear. Definitely over this time. Thank you. Um, and if you've got any questions for Anya, please do pop those in the Q&A. Um, and we'll come to those um, once we've heard from Daniela. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Daisy, for organizing this and for inviting the RSA to be um, part of it. I shall attempt to share my screen now. Um, let's see how that goes. Here we are. Um, here we are. Okay, so I'm here on behalf of my colleagues at the Regional Studies Association. We are based at Pharma for three or four years now, I couldn't quite remember how long it was. Um, we are a slightly different organization, business, history. Um, we are 55 years old, so we are certainly not a, a startup um, in any, any sense. Um, we are a learner society, a membership organization, a charity. We work globally. We are in 79 countries at the moment. Um, we work with academics, we work with policymakers, and it's all about um, regional and urban development, mainly economic development and everything that plays into it. So we work with, with planners, we work with in my environmental studies um, academics, we work with um, geographers uh, from the economy, economists, uh, social science, political studies, and so on. Um, it's a very um, diverse list of people um, we have amongst our members. So just um, the next few minutes I want to use to give you a quick overview of the work we do, what happened to us or how we've been affected by um, the lockdown and COVID-19 and then what we've done since and where we are now and looking forward. Um, so there, there are six key areas where the um, RSA works. So as I said, we are a membership organization. Um, working on a global scale. We are a rather small team. We're only eight people. Um, we have a um, part-time office in China as well in Beijing, but apart from this, it's just the eight, eight members of staff in, um, in Pharma. So we are, we are quite busy always. Um, 
Then we do a lot of conferences, between 10 to 15 conferences, international, all over the world. Part of this is also professional development sessions, um, which are um, quite important for our PhD students. Oops, this is automatic. That's very good. Um, for our PhD students in early careers, I need to talk fast enough. It's like a Pecha Kucha. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, that's part of the conference events. We have networks, we have um, geographical networks, we have ambassadors in over 70 countries, we have divisions in uh, Russia, China, India, Northern Europe, Latin America, I think that's it. We have country sections in Poland, Hungary, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, um, and we have regional branches in the UK. So um, that's the geographical networks. We have also um, networks on um, research topics. So we have different areas um, our research networks focus on and they are funded by the RSA. We have a um, pu publishing portfolio. We have five academic journals, two book series, one journal and one blog. We do uh, quite a bit of knowledge exchange and policy engagement, mainly with the European Union. We are a key partner in a number of their events and uh, the aim is always to bring together academics with policymakers so the knowledge from the academics is actually exchanged and hopefully applied um, in policy. And then we have a, um, we do f um, offer funding and research grants to support members to, to research um, on economic development. These are grants for individuals but also for groups of people. So this is the, the RSA in a nutshell. So with the um, lockdown, obviously, no events, no in-person networking, no professional development training, no, journal, no journals delivered for quite a while. So these are all the key areas why people join us. Um, so far it was. Um, yeah, so we thought it's not looking good. Um, so as everyone, we went, um, we started working from home. We uh, put in place daily catch up meetings and work planning meetings amongst the team to, um, which really helped um, develop further the team spirit and working together um, more successfully. And um, our board kindly allowed us um, for a couple of months to have wellbeing time off, which was really, really good for, for the staff. Um, to have to have that time because um, although we are being at home and we don't have to commute to work it's been very stressful I mean for many people will be able to relate to this so this has been this has been great in that sense um, for our community what we did was um, pretty quickly we went out to engage to see what's going on in different parts of the world um, because we needed to gather some intelligence to be able to plan so what's the what's the situation in China and Hong Kong, all over the world? What's the higher education situation? So um, because of the funding cuts from governments all over the world, um, universities are in quite difficult situations. In the UK, it's more because of the lack of student fees coming in. So depending on how universities are funded, this impacts on. Um, on the uh, um, higher education institutions and then research centers. Um, so this helped us to, to plan and we canceled all the events already in March for the rest of the year. So that was based on intelligence we gathered and at the moment for next year, we are not, we are not planning anything before autumn next year in person, maybe regional events, but no big international events. Um, Another thing we did straight from the start was we set up an online resource where people could send us information from their um, places, from their countries, from their regions, what's going on, how are regions, cities and industry um, affected by the lockdown and how are they addressing it. So this brought a lot more traffic to our website and was a great way to engage and to um, extend um, the audiences we reached. We then assessed, reassessed our membership offer um, because we have a couple of grants that are travel based. We have um, research network grants that are meant to bring people together to talk about a certain topic. 
So that's a conference and we fund the conference related costs. Um, so there's no point to have, have those out and ask for applications. And then we also have a travel grant which um, gives funding to attend non-RSA events. So we stopped this as well and we um, used the money and added something to it for a new grant, a small grant um, on research on the impact on COVID-19 on regions, industry and um, cities. And we had amazing feedback and, uh, and great applications for this. We are just um, um, looking at them and reviewing them. Now there might be a second round coming out later in the year because of that fantastic um, feedback we had. We also re, um, are researching the impact on our community, uh, the lockdown had, especially early career researchers have been affected because they quite often have um, childcare um, situations at home, so particularly women. Um, it seems we are, we are going back to old role mo models, even in um, highly educated circles. So it's the, the women who have to bear the, the main burden of the, the child care and this impacts on their um, ability to publish academic research and if you are an academic then your publications um, are a requirement for career development so if you don't publish this will impact on your career um, so we are looking into this to to find more information on on this the submission data and all this we are going to review we developed two new webinars um, and started them in um, end of April, so relatively quickly. The first webinar is a professional development webinar series. It's um, three times a month, um, half an hour sessions, which um, focus on, on areas. People want information on how to publish, how to develop your career, how to network. So it's mainly for the for the early career audience, but also non-native speakers um, um, really like the sessions because it gives an insight into into publishing, which might be different in in the countries where they are based. Um, the second series is a um, um, a high-profile series where we present um, latest research and big names in, in the area, in the, in the field to present on um, yeah, latest research. So this is um, a plenary session as a webinar um, and that runs once a, a month. Um, and these webinars have been, have been very, very popular. We're also looking at um, new event formats and platforms. Um, for example, in November, we are um, developing a globe trotting event which goes around the world and has little pit stops here and there. So we start in Australia, then China, India, Russia, Europe, Africa, Latin America, North America. So this will be um, over two weeks we will have these um, sessions traveling all over the world and that's quite um, exciting. Um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, and then we also look into, into online platforms that, can, that we can use for conferences because end of the day, if you think about it, conf the conference format hasn't really changed over the last 50 years, something like this. I mean, you go to a conference, to lis you listen to a conference and that's it. And now is really the time to be innovative and creative about um, conferences and um, knowledge exchange. So that's actually quite positive, I think. It's challenging, but it's also very positive. Uh, and we are looking at new engagement tools. Um, we are finalizing a new membership app at the moment, which gives more networking opportunities and facilities to members, and they can network amongst themselves independently from us. So they have the app, they can see what people work on, where their, their keywords, based on keywords, and then reach out and, and set up meetings or chats or whatever, they don't need us for it. So while we are in lockdown or in, in um, social distancing times, there is an opportunity. Obviously, people need to be quite uh, proactive to do that. And it's a bit more work than meeting someone at a coffee, coffee um, stop during a conference. But it, there are facilities there. So um, we should make that still happen. Um, in regards to business, obviously we had a, um, a loss of income due to cancelled events and contracts. We also work as conference organizers 
Um, so we lost all this. Um, potentially there's a long-term impact because we could lose our relevance in the field. I mean, you know, if you can't meet in person, that's very important. It's a very important aspect for our members. Um, what do you do? So this is the, the thinking at the beginning. Um, and then we looked at savings were possible. We cancelled our travel insurances and so on. Um, we applied for the for the um, Lewis Council discretionary grant scheme, which was suggested by the um, by SINC. Thank you very much for this. We were successful. Thank you. Um, so that was great. Um, yeah, and just um, assessing, reassessing where we are and um, where we are going. How am I going for doing for time? I'm doing okay. So yeah, so now the sun is rising um, and it's, um, it's really about opportunities and um, yeah, I, yes it's not easy and we will have to change the ways we do the way we do things but i really see a lot of opportunities and and if we are quick um and put things in place we can really make a, a difference and grow we have already um widened our reach and reached new audiences with our webinars for example in the first month we had um over 2600 participants from 91 countries we would never have, oops, that's the end. We would never have reached these audiences before with an on-site event. So we, we extended our, our marketing reach already. So it's, um, it's that's quite a, a positive already. Membership growth, yes, we have seen membership growth, which is um, not so common at the moment with membership organizations. It hasn't been massive growth, but it has been growth and that's, um, that's positive. New conference platforms, as I said, we're working on the um, on a um, website that will allow us to do um, a large conference next year in June, where we have um, breakout rooms, parallel sessions, but also networking opportunities for people, lots of things going on. We work with um, new partners and also um, strengthened existing partnerships and they will also be part of this conference to extend the number of people participating because we, you want to have people in the room to listen to presentations and not just the presenters. So for this, you need more people and, and partners we work with um, will help with, with this and also add um, value to the event. We will um, and have diversified our offer. Um, the team has learned new skills. We have all, you know, working from home, knowing how to run webinars. Everyone apart from me is very good in that. Um, so, and we are more flexible. The organization is more flexible. We as staff are more flexible. So, yeah, for, for me, it's, a, it's actually not as bad as it might have seemed at the beginning. There's hope. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great to see kind of the kind of the innovation and the different things that have managed to come out of this. I know we were speaking the other day and um, you said that maybe some of these things have been kind of talked about before and they're possibly in the pipeline. But this is really kind of sped that whole process up, hasn't it? Yes, absolutely. We have um, worked on virtual conferences um, last year and earlier this year, and it was, you know, with the flyless movement and all this. And um, and this is now, um, yeah, speeded up. People are more open. Before that, it was all oh, meeting someone online. No, this is really not for me. But now we're open because we do this all the time. It's not a problem anymore. So it had, in a way, um, yeah, it's... Um, it's been it's been positive in that sense for us yeah and i think for the industry as well i mean it can only can only be um good if we we change and improve our ways anyway and long term there will always be even if if we can go back to meetings in person we will remain having a virtual element because i mean the, having all these people and voices heard i mean why would we lock them out suddenly this is just we can't do that so yeah thank you and um, before we've got any questions for daniela put them in the q and a um, we've had a couple come in um one for anya here um you mentioned virtual networking in ten terms of your role at gbd um can you share a little about how you've created effective 
virtual networking opportunities. Well, GDB have been completely changing. So similar to Daniela's experience, we used to give, um, you know, most of, most of the activities we do is in-person networking, which we used to have a mixture of like the big members meetings where we have a hundred people coming uh, through to smaller coffees um, where we had maybe 20 or 30 people or, or even sort of sit down meals for the, for the speed net speed networking um, where you have like um, you have starters and then you have 60 seconds to sell your business to all the people on the, on the table. So obviously we can't do that in person um, virtually. Sorry, we can't do that in person anymore. So we've got to replace um, with um, virtual ideas. So most of the most of the things that we've done virtually are a series of webinars. So it allows our members themselves to have a platform in front of members. So that and it's it's good learning. So it's not just like there you go, speak, speak you know, push your business. It's anything from from um, uh, marketing to sales to uh, good management systems, how to deal with the crisis. So from that point of view is that. But we're also doing the networking, again, using the Zoom um, setup um, and using breakout rooms. And that's really useful just to have that. So we usually have about 20, 30. We have up to about 40 or 50 sometimes for the, for the big members meetings. But having the time for the breakout rooms, which is all organised by, by the, the meeting host, and um, rather than just let people talk at random, uh, they try to give them a little bit of an angle to talk like what have you been doing for COVID in, in terms of um, you know, sort of dealing with your staff or what are you doing about opening. So to ha try to have it a little bit more structured rather than breakout rooms, everybody just goes into them and nobody knows what they're doing. And that's really helped. We, we've found that people have really valued sharing their experiences with people and actually we've got a more close-knit community because of it but it's all, all through Zoom and encouraging people to make contact afterwards as well, of course. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and another question for you, it's coming from Maria. Um, one of the challenges, challenges of doing everything online does increase the pressure on the servers hosting these things, the main output being heat. Do you have any thoughts on how, uh, how we can factor this in? Mm, yes, that's always the trouble is the heat, the heat output or well, heat recovery is the classic thing. So rather than just like belting the heat out through through the uh, through the air handling units, actually having some sort of heat recovery and that could be used to heat the building or buildings nearby. One of my clients who have a big data centre up in London, they've actually set it up so that when the housing estate that's being just built across the river um, is, is, being, being, is being built, that they're going to actually use their heat from the from the servers and and fed into a district heating system so there's no easy way of doing it it's very technical from a heat recovery point of view but yeah it is possible well, that's great thank you uh, and uh, another one in the q and a here for you on um this is from susan um so she's saying um so much of this is behavioural and we all have a responsibility, not just the council. Um, do you think vendors, namely the big burger and pizza joints whose rubbish was everywhere, have a huge responsibility? Um, and she's asking um, if you had any thoughts on how your product could help uh, in this regard. Um, yeah, so it, it's very true that um, I, I do believe that every person, um, every kind of uh, community, whether it's a food vendor, council, person eating the food has the responsibility to kind of pass the, the container um, whether it's a single use or um, kind of and place it in the right place. Um, in terms of working with the uh, high um, well-recognized chains that would be really amazing because I think that um, when smaller vendors hear that the larger chains are, are doing something maybe even like at the beginning where it's being piloted that they, they are more um, kind of easily um kind of uh they'll, they'll kind of come into the the community um if they know that someone else is, is doing it at a bigger scale um i know that um with the council they're going to um encourage uh, an extended producer responsibility legislation 
um, which means that the food vendors will have to pay a fee for um, kind of their waste disposal. So um, when this comes into place in the next few years, um, that fee would be something that can be translated into um, this reuse model rather than paying a fine or you know extra money for throwing away this waste disposal why don't you kind of put that money into something which eliminates the problem in the first place brilliant thank you um but last couple of minutes for any question any extra questions that every uh, anyone has um but thank you so much to all three of you for being such a great panel uh, today. Like I said, um, to start, I'll be sharing everyone's slides um, in the follow-up email. Um, we are running another webinar next week. I'm going to drop the link for that uh, into the chat for you. Um, and that is looking at the future of uh, the workplace. Um, you know, we've all had to adapt the way we work and kind of the buildings that we work in are needing to adapt as well. Um, so obviously, um, I'm now back in the office at Sussex Innovation. Um, we're continued, continuing to um, support our members, have been doing throughout lockdown, but obviously mainly remotely. We are now having some face-to-face -face meetings, which is really exciting. Um, if you would like to find out a bit more about the kind of business support that we can offer and kind of some of the funded support, we've been given um, some funding from uh, ERDF, which we're able to put towards funded business support. Uh, please complete this inquiry form, which I'm sharing uh, with you now. Um, so yeah, oh, master mask meetings, Maria says, yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Daisy, may I say something? Oh, yes, please do. Yeah, no, ju just to say that I've been having support from Sussex Innovation recently. Um, started at the beginning of the uh, the beginning of the year, sort of like February time. Actually, COVID has been really useful to allow me the time to actually act upon the, the recommendations that have been made to me. Um, yeah, thoroughly recommend getting involved with Sussex Innovation. It's, you know, it's, like, it's allowed me to well, obviously access some really clever people who know about these things much better than I do. You know, I just do the work, you know, I don't know running the business, but um, you know, it just helps, helps me as a person, but not only helps my business, but helps me as a person develop as well. So I thoroughly recommend the service that you offer to everybody. And you know, if it's funded, even better, marvelous. Thank you. I didn't even pay her to say no, that. No, fantastic. <laughs> you know. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so hopefully see you next week, guys. Thank you again uh, Thank to our you. panel. Um, yeah, see you soon. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.